I'm delighted to be here today with Gavin Ashenden, who was with us a couple of months ago, and uh, everybody really enjoyed what he had to say and wanted to hear more from him. So glad to have Gav Gavin back again. And just to remind everybody, Gavin was a former chaplain to the Queen in England, a university psychology lecturer. He had his own radio show on the BBC, and now he blogs at ashenden.org as a Catholic apologist for the faith. So uh, you were formerly Anglican and now Catholic, and yes. also a psychology lecturer. So you're, yeah, and you've read Maps of Meaning from Jordan Peterson. So you you fit nicely in our wheelhouse here in this little corner of the internet. And um, I have a lot of questions because theology is absolutely not my background, but I keep running into all these theological issues as I'm trying to understand various things. And recently I've been doing a series with um, Mark LeFevre where we're discussing the conversation that Jordan Peterson had with John Verbeke. We've done five episodes so far and we're still only through the first hour of that conversation. But um, something came up recently in, in part of the conversation that I was thinking about um, John Verbeke mentioned speculative realism, and that made me realize that I have all these questions about open and relational theology and process theology. So those are some of the things I wanted to pick your brain about. And, um, and just some other things that have been kind of puzzling me lately. I've heard a lot of talk about this discussion that's going on around the individual versus the person. There's some theological issues related to that, I think. And um, we had also kind of threatened to talk about the real and the counterfeit in relation to ecumenism. And also the kind of the way you thread the needle between the collective and the community. So um, that's just kind of where we're headed for everybody who's watching. And I think I'd like to start with just the general issue of well, a couple of general issues, dualism versus monism and, um, and being versus becoming. <laughs> so let, let me, can I cut through the Gordian knot, first of all, <laughs> well, on, only because um, uh, I, it was my meat and drink uh, in, when I was a university lecturer to compare and contrast different philosophical frameworks and above all their presuppositions um, but I think that the real issue is no longer a, a, a subdivision of post-enlightenment fractions which is what I think philosophy of mind comes down to uh, but I think it's the development of a Christian mind in other words I think that if you fuse the perspective of the books in the Bible with the 2000 years of thinking and praying of the Catholic and Orthodox part of the church. I'll explain why I exempt Protestantism in a moment. Mm -hmm. Then what you get is that you get a kind of Christian take on, you get a Christian anthropology, you get a Christian view of, of the supernatural, you get a Christian view of the relationship between good and evil. And, and this cuts across, for example, monism dualism. Um, the, the, you know, the, when you start arguing about monism dualism, what you're really talking about is how do we manage philosophical cat categories that embrace reality as we know it without slipping into the kind of mo monism that doesn't allow evil to be taken seriously, which is ultimately uh, what, what Jung came to do by the state of a hand and the invention of the shadow. Or how do we take evil seriously without becoming dualists and ending up in an oversimplistic position where we think that evil is as strong as good? Um, and so I think the antidote to this is not to argue between dualism and monism, not to say which of the sliced segments of post-enlightenment philosophy are the most superior ones, but to say, how do we develop a Christian mind so that we think and pray and argue and discuss like St. Augustine did, or like Aquinas did, or like Thomas More did, or like Anselm did, uh, or like Eusebius did, because there's a continuity of perspective through these minds 
that seems to me to um, uh, allow us not to slip into a too tight a gear with whatever the intellectual fashion is at the moment. And the problem with intellectual fashions at the moment is that we're we're in a speeding car careering around a racetrack with 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 a with a, a loose steering wheel and no brakes because the Enlightenment has has uh, thrown up so many um, curved balls <laughs> that we're having a very time hard, a very hard time handling them. Um, and uh, and and so all those for for professionals of, of theological and philosophical discourse, it can be quite fun. I, it leaves most people bored because that's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to manage. They're trying to square the circle of how do I remain hopeful when there's so much suffering in the world? How do I remain important when critical race theory tells me I only matter as as, as part of a power crazed or power deprived group? Um, how, how do I matter when so many things go wrong in the world and yet I'm told there's a God who's looking after me? There are many more practical existential questions that have to do with faith and above all the person of Jesus because in the end as Christians what we do is to we, we refer back always to Jesus and say either he is the Logos, the Son of God, the principle come into the world, in which case let us allow him to form us or, or he isn't, in which case let's 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 head off and engage with Muhammad or with Buddha uh, or, or with process theology, um, which is a form of existential narcissism, intellectual narcissism. Um, so, so that that's why I think essentially what we're trying to do is form the Christian mind and dialogue with the with the very sophisticated uh, offspring of the Enlightenment that our philosophical climate is throwing up at the moment. Well, it's really interesting that you said all that because, I mean, I find myself in that position when I'm talking theology and philosophy with people is that I always feel like there's this, this uh, polarity or binary that's being set up and I'm somewhere in the middle of that, right? And, uh, but when I go off and I, you know, somebody talks about something like process theology and I go off and I start looking at it and I run into Alfred North Whitehead and I'm trying to read Whitehead and, and trying to read him with an open mind and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking there's something that just doesn't quite sit right with me here. But then I'm reading C.S. Lewis and he's talking about Whitehead as one of the, the, uh, the world's great philosophers. And so I'm like, how did C.S. Lewis, what was C.S. Lewis seeing in Whitehead? Obviously, he must have read a lot more Whitehead than I have, but um, isn't Whitehead a process theologian, or wasn't he a process philosopher? And, and so, 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 so let's, let's deal with, with, with things slowly. I remember being very excited by process theology when I first came across it, thinking, oh, I think this is something I could like and believe in. And then as time went by, I realized the reason why I liked process theology was because I was fascinated by myself. And process theology, I, I began to think, was, a, was an intellectualizing of my own narcissism. So as I grow and I develop, God somehow invests himself in me in a, in a and it's a wonderful idea, but, but it makes, I think it makes me more important than I really am. So if you ask the Christian mind, how important I am, I'm less important than process theology makes me. So I think process theology inflates my, my, my value in a way that is essentially narcissistic, and, and I don't trust it. Now, Lewis, of course, was a philosopher originally by training and moved into literature. And Whitehead is a very clever man, but um, we, we can't, as Christians, we can't allow ourselves to place philosophy on such a podium that, that the person who sells us our fruit and vegetables becomes less of a Christian if they don't understand it. In other words, there's a kind of intellectual um, Phariseeism, uh, uh, which I'm happy to, I mean, I have, I have four university degrees. I'm, I like batting the ball around, but, <laughs> but, but, but as I lie in bed at night fighting with evil and praying, process theology doesn't come to my aid. It doesn't tell me enough about myself in relationship to God. Now, um, Mary does, the saints do, Jesus above all does, uh, the martyrs do, um, but, but Whitehead doesn't. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so I think one of the things we have to do as Christians is to say, 
um, to what extent does this help develop the Christian mind? See, the great thing about Lewis was that, that, that although he wasn't as big a philosopher as Whitehead, yet his understanding of the Christian mind was so profound that he was able to put it into children's stories. Well, that's the thing that I've always thought about is it ha the, the story has to scale for people who have limited cognitive ability just as well as it scales for people who are off the chart geniuses, right? It, it has right. to scale. If it's true, it scales that way. So one of the things that the Christians have discovered in the 20th century is myth. And by myth, I don't mean uh, untrue tales of the imagination. I mean more in the sense that Jung, this time getting it right, was, which is uh, universal tales that incorporate our lives and, and archetypes beyond our lives. So your readers probably know that Lewis thought that he could argue people into the kingdom of heaven until he came across a very clever Catholic woman theologian whose name begins with A, it wasn't Arbuthnot, but it'll come to me in a moment. And she trounced him in the Socratic, in a public debate in Oxford. And he was so demoralized by this, um, and Struthers maybe, um, that he, he withdrew from public debate for a year, having had a huge, terrible crisis. And at that point, demoralized and depressed, began to write Narnia stories. Now his Narnia stories were much more, much more powerful vehicle of the Christian mind than his in extremely sophisticated intellectual debates in the Socratic club. And so if we look at the Narnia stories uh, or, or the, the, the great myths that Tolkien wrote, what we find there is a retelling of the drama of the human being in relation to God and good and evil that anyone can get. And so people who are not terribly educated and have used their artisan skills get it at a, at a, at a straightforward level. And people who've been playing international gymnastics with their mind all years long uh, get it in a more abstruse level, but everyone gets it. And, and my problem with, with doing very clever theology and philosophy is it, it's a game for some very sophisticated people. And I've never seen it make people holier. I've seen it make them more pretentious. Mm -hmm. But as Christians, what we need to be doing is doing the kind of theology uh, that makes us holier. And that's why I think this, the pursuit of the Christian mind and so, for example, one of the most important elements in the pursuit of the Christian mind would be, do I believe in the supernatural? And that, that's because that's, a, that's one of the most difficult things in the discussion of the Christian faith today, in the face of the, of the atheists and the post-enlightenment thinkers, in the face of, of people who, who think that medievalism was something primitive, instead of one of the great epic highs of civilization, uh, because they've been mistaught history. So I would say that one of the um, one of the, the, the critical things that we ought to discuss with our fellow travelers is, is the supernatural. Without the supernatural, the gospels are are a a misleading series of of mythological fables in the bad sense. With the supernatural, they open the door to a reality that enlightenment criteria inadequately boundary. And we know that because art is always taking us through, through the kind of the, the, the dimensions that we're used to. Love is always taking us through the dimensions we're used to. Longing, hope. Um, and we, so we have to escape this very odd prison compound that the last four or 500 years of our culture have placed us in. We call it the Enlightenment, a, a place where things only have value if you can measure them, if you can test them, if you can prove them. Well, that's a perfectly splendid way of managing to deal with a very complex universe, but it's inadequate because it doesn't, there's a whole, there's a whole aspect of our humanity that that doesn't describe or talk to. And that's where the Christian mind comes in because it does. Well, so I was interested that you used the word supernatural because I thought I recalled in, I, I mean, I know there's, so many threads part, connected to this, but um, didn't Lewis avoid using the word supernatural? Not, not that he didn't understand that, that there is something outside of the realm that we are currently in, or maybe not outside isn't the right word, but that we dwell in, we dwell in this kind of interpenetrating system of worlds. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's very right? good. Right? <clears throat> yeah, the Greek it's, word. It's not so much. I think when we use the word supernatural, that takes the the scientists who are have kind of drilled down into scientism 
and they say you're saying that that there's something that reaches in and affects this world and that's not the way the world works but it isn't so much that something reaches in and affects this world i mean um <sighs> reality is is more than just what we're seeing in fact i mean i've come to the conclusion and this this is probably heretical sometimes i say things that are probably heretical and i don't want to be heretical but it seems to me that jesus is reality and then that means that my 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 being as a person is to come into relationship with jesus come into relationship with reality mm -hmm. in such a way that that when I discover places where I'm not lining up with Christ, then then that's, you know, sometimes we say, oh, I got hit upside the head by a two by four, but that's really just the graciousness of God letting me know that I'm on the wrong track and that I'm not becoming a part of his gracious and loving reality. When I when I abide in his gracious and loving reality, then those things don't happen. I, I think that's quite right. I talk in terms of sub-real and, and plus-real. One of the things that's happened as I've got older is I, I've, I've been more clear about the way in which I've seen that people as they grow become more real as human beings mm -hmm. or less real, em emptier, fuller or emptier is a better way of saying yes, it. Yes, 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 yes. More people, complete or less complete, yeah. Right, and people who, uh, which I think is what Jesus was talking about when he said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, yes, using the word yes, uh -huh. telos, which is a teleological which has a goal which is, is completion so let's go with complete more or less complete so one of the exciting things about growing older <laughs> is seeing what St Paul meant by saying that whilst the outer bit decays the inner bit renews and the inner bit renews and people become more complete and so I see Chris people who've said their prayers and trusted Jesus and they seem to me to have a depth and a vibrancy and a luminosity and, and an authenticity all kinds of words we can use in their humanity that is startlingly vivid and I see other people almost like empty wardrobes <laughs> walking around with nothing inside. The eyes are dead, the inflections are dead, the appetites are dead. There's just not much at home. And this is not judgmental in the sense of condemning people. This is discernment. This is saying, where is life? And one of the reasons I'm a Christian is because, I, because those who are in touch with Jesus are more alive. One of the earliest theologians said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. You become fully alive when you engage with Jesus and you let him work on you and Christ is formed inside you. Once again, that's part of the Christian mind or the, or the Christian becoming. Um, now, the problem with Whitehead is that, that he, he wants to make the Godhead in a, in a way sort of derivative so that, that, that God canonically, that is, God empties himself and invests himself in us and our becoming is a kind of amplification or deification of God. He, he um, delegates his own becoming in and to us. But it's, it's a clever idea, but it, it's, it's a dangerous one because we're, we're, we're likely to fall into one of two heresies or errors. And that is, we either think too much of ourselves or too little of ourselves. And when we think too little of ourselves, we fall into despair, want to do away with ourselves. And when we think too much of ourselves, we become egocentric narcissists. So, um, I'm prone to both, but I don't find that Whitehead helps me uh, at, at, at all. And I, I think the idea that somehow God, demin God, God risks part of himself in my becoming. Um, well, I suppose if, if, it, if, it, if it gives me a sense that God loves me enough to risk himself, okay, but the incarnation already did that. Jesus already did that on the cross. God risks himself in the incarnation to, to suffer, be rejected, and to have the most dreadful experience on the cross. So it's already there in the incarnation. I don't, I don't need it to be represented to me in a form which strokes my narcissism, which is what I think process theology does. Well, I guess one of the reasons that I got kind of interested in process theology is not so much about the personal um, standpoint, but... Um, looking at things like quantum mechanics and just the way that the world lays itself out at the particle level <clears throat> and the, the probabilities and, and all of that, thinking about 
how at any point in time there are all these this all this potential and all these probabilities and whatever it is that causes that probability to become concretized so that it becomes a stable reality that leaves open an infinite number of possibilities and that what that says to me and <laughs> this is because i'm sort of simplistic is that you know the scripture says that god will make a way he will always make a way and so if i if i trust myself to him and i move forward thinking i'm doing the right thing and but then i do the wrong thing and i make a mistake or i fall or i sin or something it's not over because he has a way of rearranging or or making it possible for even my error to align itself up into a possibility that becomes a good thing absolutely right so yeah. so that's saying to me that even the particles that are in potential that and and so if god now this is the part i don't really get because i'm not a theologian but god is before space and time but he's also in all in all so he's he's here and he's there and he's you know he is in everything and and he's outside of everything because he's all in all so that means he's also here with all the particles and all of these things going on so that there's got to be some way in which he is allowing change to happen sacrificially yes i mean the cross the cross certainly but but in everything there's some way in which that's happening and i don't exactly know how to explain it but um well, and, and so you know, we, we, once again, we, we, we walk a very delicate balance between, uh, between that and pantheism and panentheism, a right. whole series of, of gradations in which God that's, is. That's why you're here, because I don't want to get on the wrong side of that balance. <laughs> well, but, but, but so we can get anxious about that. But, but there are, I'm, you know, let's get back to the Christian mind. If you want to do it with quantum mechanics, you can. And if you're clever enough to understand i'm not but but I, I i i understand i'm with you so far but i want to go back to mother julian uh, uh an un, a not a moderately educated nun in the uh, 1380s in england and she said the same thing as you but she said sin is behovely um because sin is, sin is, sin is, is behovely it's a medieval english word saying um it's it's becoming sin god can work with sin Sin is not totally a bad thing because God will take it and bring good out of it. And, 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 and she had this wonderful ringing sort of chorus through her, her work called The Showings, which is all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. T.S. Eliot picks it up and quotes it in mm -hmm. four quartet. So it's a, it's a wonderful aphorism. And she's, but what she's doing in, in other languages saying the same as you, there's nothing that can go so badly wrong that God can't take it and bring good out of it. There was a, there was a wonderful uh, medieval carol that said, um, it's a very good thing that, uh, that, that Eve ate the apple or Mary would never have been our queen. And, and leaving aside the role of Mary, what it was really saying is, we would never have had this, this wonderful um, Theotokos figure who gives birth to the incarnate Logos, this unbelievable, wonderful mystery, if, if Eve hadn't screwed up. Isn't it a great thing that Eve screwed up? Because look at this cascade of grace and interestingness and autonomy that we have. And then look at, look at the cross and the resurrection and salvation. Wow, it's good that Eve screwed up and ate the apple, says this medieval carol, says Julian of Norwich, says quantum mechanics. But we're saying the same thing, really. It's just you just choose your particular piece of poetry or piece of physics as the vehicle that says this. But the, the Christian mind says, Nothing is so far away from God that by falling into his hands, things can't be put better and put right. Well, so it sounds like what you just said is that the fall. <laughs> I won't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I mean, it sounds as though what you're saying is that the fall was um, 
and we've played around with this idea quite a bit in discussions here that the fall is not not that it was intentional but that it was planned for before it happened absolutely and julian in other has words, this... it wasn't plan b no um well we don't know whether it was plan a b c or d but it was plan <laughs> and i mean so mother julian has this conversation with god in one of her visions and she says look the black death has just happened in europe this is a place of pretty awful suffering are you really sure you knew what you were doing when you created the world because we're all having to pay really quite a high price for it was it worth it and then in this, this vision jesus replies to her well i'm going to do something on the last day there's going to be kind of an inversion of everything and on that last day you you will praise me because you'll see as i see now but can't explain to you you will see that, that not only was it worth it but the worse the worse the evil was the greater your praise will be the greater the act of inversion and redemption will be and and, and he says you just have to trust me for this but that's the plan that's what's going to happen which is why julian can say in the face of of the inquisition and the black death and and and, and you know the dreadful uh all the dreadful things that happened in the 14th century all should be well and all should be well and all manner of things shall be well god will make all things well well, this is this is the Christian mind. This is the way this allows us to meet the death deaths within our family, cancers in our community, um, the, the breakdown of people, awful, awful tragedies, broken marriages, um, wounded children. And we can look at God like as Julian did and say, really, are you sure you know what you're doing? Because actually, this is almost more than than I can bear. Um, and uh, I, I, I'd like to tell you of a, a small experience I had that's really, um, and I apologize for doing it because it might make me sound like I'm a, I'm a pretentious experiencer of things, but my experiences in, in, in the Christian life have only come when I've broken down and failed. <laughs> there was a point, it was a point, it was about 2008, I think, and I was at a monastery called Teze, and I was, um, I'd, I'd had a, I kind of had a real existential crash. And uh, I was praying late in the night uh, in this wonderful church in Burgundy. Uh, and there were lots of people who had crashes. You could tell because they were all weeping in little dark corners <laughs> and offering their prayers. And I was saying to the Lord, this is too painful. This is, this is really, this is more than I can bear. And you've taken me to a, to, to a dark and broken place and I don't think I'm going to survive. Really? <laughs> can you not help me? Um, and then the Lord said to me, I'm, well, OK, I'm really sorry about that. But but I'm actually I, I've, I've got a problem, too. I'm on the cross. Do you think you could share my pain for a moment? And I was a bit put out by this. I said, look, I've come to tell you about my pain. <laughs> Don't interrupt me. I have a problem there. I've got some real problems. I was telling you about my pain and you, you want to make me think about your pain. Well, I said, well, all right. Yes, of course. Well, all right. Let's get this over with. Yes, I'll share your pain. So he said, well, then I'm going to invite you up onto the cross with me. And in my prayerful imagination, he was in, before me on the cross. I think I was praying before one of those wonderful, that wonderful Franciscan icon of Jesus on the cross. And before I knew it, I was on the cross and I was being crucified and the pain and the despair, not just the physical pain, the dark accusing despair was was terrible. If, uh, it, I suddenly remember the times I had an operation and the anaesthetist says, count to 10 and let's see how far you get before you're out. And I thought, this is too difficult. This is too painful. I better count to 10 to get through the first 10 seconds of this because I don't think I can manage. It was too awful. Uh, a terrible physical pain across my chest and my throat and a terrible existential pain. And I, I think I got to about seven and I said to the Lord, you could have to put me down. I can't take this. This, this is too terrible. And, 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 and so it seemed to me, if this actually happened, he, he put me down and I was back there on my knees in front of him going, wow, I had no idea. That was where you are, were, are, will be, whatever, you know, because the, the, the act of crucifixion is beyond, is not limited by time and space. We didn't have any further conversation. My own suffering was put into perspective. 
I, I think I was given an insight into, into our Lord's most terrible suffering. He's both off the cross and he's on the cross. I mean, we're back into quantum mechanics again. These, these contradictory things, dimensions are, 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 <clears throat> are not mutually exclusive in some way that goes beyond our enlightenment categories. Um, now, the reason I, I say that is because um, after that came the resurrection. Out, out of his hell on the cross came the salvation of the whole of humanity. Out of the salvation of humanity will come the restoration of the new heaven and the, the new earth. The new heaven and the new earth will be souls won by his blood, praising him in love and adoration forever. All the things we've longed for here that have caught us up in hunger will, will be in permanent moment. And, and at, at that point, if we're asked, was it worth it? I think we'll say, oh my, <laughs> thank goodness no one switched my lights off. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so glad to be here. And the book of Revelation is all about, I'm so glad to be here around the throne. So, so for us caught on the journey still, we need to develop the Christian mind that says in the face of, of death and disaster and pain and misery, and difficulty and misunderstanding and, and treachery and abandonment and depravity. Is it going to be okay? And Julian of Norwich says with St. Paul, who says with Jesus, yes, it's going to be okay. And, and what, it's going to be more than okay. God is going to bring something deeply beautiful out of it. And how do we know that? St. Paul says, it's a good thing we suffered because we can then bring to other people the comfort we were given in our suffering. Our suffering becomes fuel for for the soothing and the, the hallowing, the helping of people who are in a very dark place. It, it's a good thing we suffered, says St. Paul. It's a good thing Eve ate the apple. I'd, I'd like to step back a little bit to the point where you, you mentioned that Julian said this and also that you have said this at various times. Lord, are you sure you know what you're doing? Yeah. When, when the tough times come. But to me, that's isn't that sort of saying um, this? Well, okay. So there, there is tragedy, and then there is evil. So yeah. things that can happen in our lives can be, well, not just the result of tragedy or evil, but the result of my own stupidity or of my own yeah. sin. Sure. And in, the, in those cases, why would God? I mean, it's not that God planned that thing to happen. He may have permitted it to happen for some reason, but my sin is not part of his determining. So for me to say to him, or if, I, if I'm in the midst kind of, of fallout from something that I've done, how can I say to him, are you sure you know what you're doing? <laughs> it's more well, it, 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 Do, it, do it I know what is. I did? <laughs> I mean, the old, one, of the, one of the gifts of the first covenant or the Old Testament is that it, it does this splendid piece of truncation and said says god's responsible for everything he is the lord you know he takes responsibility for the whole lot indeed it took a while to develop a theology of evil because because um god was responsible for everything in the same way god gave um god gave the third reich autonomy and with that autonomy it killed six million jews the jews are still saying did you know what you were doing when you gave the Third Reich autonomy, when you allowed the devil to infect their minds in this way that they became agents of harrying the people of God? Um, I've made some terrible mistakes that God gave me the freedom to do. And I sometimes say, well, couldn't you have, I don't know, couldn't you have warned me off in advance? Normally he has, of course. He says, well, I did. Usually you discover he tried. Um, I think all I'm really doing is, is articulating so not everyone will want to say to God at all times, Lord, did you know what you were doing? But I'm speaking to those people who are so knocked down by have got the, the, the breath of hope winded and knocked out of them, for whom that is a question. And it well, was certainly I guess, a question. I guess one of the reasons I'm wondering is I'm wondering where is there no place for human action? Of course. I mean, let's just go back and explore a little bit the Third Reich. That was not an inevitability. I don't believe that was an inevitability. If 
if the actions of individual Christians inside the Third Reich had been different, it may not have happened the way that it happened. They they That's allowed true, them, the they th allowed this themselves to be to the, have their thinking twisted and perverted, and and they allowed themselves to go along with the lie. Sometimes, I mean, some of them stood up against it, but some of them went along with the lie. We're seeing some of that now with with some of the lies that are being bandied about that people are falling into and, and don't know where to look for the truth because and they're not standing up against the lie and they're not speaking truth and they're not acting into the truth. And when we do that, don't we bear some responsibility for all the bad things that happen? It's not, I, I'm just saying we can't lay it all at God's feet and say, look, you let this happen. So you're quite right. There are three elements. There's God, there's devil, and there's, and there's, there's a human autonomy. One of the reasons that I was prepared for conversion was the Holocaust, <clears throat> because I looked at I looked at Beethoven and Goethe and Schiller and, and, and Mozart, who was Austrian, but then Hitler was Austrian, uh, and said, how is it how is it possible that out of the culture that produced this extraordinary beauty, I'm 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 I mean I'm you know, I'm, a, I'm kind of Neoplatonist by instinct, uh, and and showed us something of God that within within decades it could produce a holocaust i i don't see how human beings could have done this unaided there has to be an inf there has to be a kind of supernatural infection that sped up their flaws and it was one of the things that made me most willing to consider the existence of the agency of evil that we call the devil from time to time i disbelieved in the devil mainly because i couldn't cope with separating evil from from mental illness and turmoil uh, so I spent about 25, that was partly why I became a Jungian. Um, and, and that all disappeared when the devil attacked me in person. And I discovered he was he was extremely real. And um, I needed to find ways that the Christian mind and Christian experience provided to Christians to, to resist him. But undoubtedly, we have these three elements. We have a, an active anti-God agency that we call the devil, the divider, the accuser, the father of lies, whatever you want. Uh, and the fallen angels and we have our lord and we have the saints and the angels and we have us in the middle um and uh i remember again as a boy reading a wonderful book called by, by about a, a um a priest called don camillo by an italian journalist called giovanni guareschi and i read them about eight or nine and they're set in the um in italy uh and they're, 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 the drama is between a a rather powerful priest and his best friend and best enemy, the communist mayor, Peponi. Uh, and Don Camillo and Peponi live out this great conflict in the 20th century between the Catholic Church and, and communism. And, uh, and, and in the drawings, Don Camillo, the priest, always has a white angel and a white devil on each shoulder, and they both speak to him. And, and in this kind of Narnian-esque way, what is she, tells the story of, of the 20th century conflict in a fairly bucolic narrative but absolutely nailing it mythologically because he treats good and evil seriously and and here we have just as i've described this tripartite experience of human autonomy in the middle and god and the devil or you know the good angel and the bad angel on, on either shoulder and that seems to me you know again that's part of the christian mind the christian mind says we can look at life if we look at life like that it will make most sense it'll make le le least sense if you rub out evil It'll make least sense if you rub out autonomy. It'll make least sense if you rub out the, the, the victory of God. You need to hold all these three things together mm -hmm. and then you'll have a sense of what's going on. It's called the Christian mind. Yeah, I like the way you laid that out. So you mentioned at the very beginning that you didn't want to that you you wanted to talk about the Christian mind from the standpoint of the traditional Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church and you wanted to leave out Protestantism. So one of the things I said at the beginning that we might talk about is is there any path that that would is there any non counterfeit path that could lead to ecumenism or ecumenism I'm not sure how to pronounce it. <laughs> And, uh, and why do you leave out Protestantism? So I've changed my mind recently, which is one of the reasons I became a Catholic. Um, I think the reason I leave out Protestantism is not because I'm, not, not because I'm claiming a, a, a kind of denominational superiority. 
I am and I'm not. <laughs> um, but because Protestantism is founded upon a, a dreadful category error. And that is, it reads history backwards and it makes some terrible mistakes. So it starts history in about 1520 and, and, then, um, uh, and, then, and then reads the Bible backwards into time. Whereas that just isn't what happened. What happened was you had Jesus and the apostles and then you had the first century in which the, the, the Bible began to come together along with a whole lot of extra material. The Bible, in fact, wasn't formulated really until the Council of Carthage in about 380. Um, and so Protestants will always say, oh, the Bible takes precedence over the church. Of course it does. But actually, it was the church who decided what the Bible was and what it wasn't. But, what we, but, but this, this could be a sterile argument. What we actually have is we have Jesus made a promise to the church. that The Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth. And there were things we couldn't, that the apostles couldn't cope with then. Now, whatever that means, that must mean that over the next, uh, we can make it, we can choose a period of time. What, 50, 100, 200, 500? What period of time was Jesus talking about? I don't think I want to say, but, but the Holy Spirit will lead the church into all truth. And if you start church history on the day of Pentecost and you go forward through, um, through Polycarp, uh, through Irenaeus of Lyon, um, through uh, Ignatius of Antioch, through Clement of Rome, through the early popes, um, through Eusebius, through Gregory the Wonderworker, what, what you have is a series of councils and the acorn becomes a tree. But you see the acorn becoming a tree. You see the, you see the branches coming out of the acorn. You say, OK, that branch is a, really, is a legitimate part of the growth of the acorn. I see where it comes from now. But what Protestantism does is it starts with the Bible in 1520 and a whole series of cultural givens and norms at the beginning of the Enlightenment. And it says we're now going to reconstruct Christianity without the mind of the apostles, without the work of the Holy Spirit. It's been going on for 1500 years and we're going to recreate the church ex nihilo. But that's not what Jesus said was going to happen. And the problem with that is you then your Christianity then has 1,500 years of amnesia. You're like an amnesiac telling the family history. And you've, you've forgotten it all. <laughs> you don't know it anymore. And, and that's why there are arguments about what the Eucharist is and what Mary is and what the saints are and what the miracles are and what the Pope is and what the, what the patriarchs of the word, the, the, the Pentarchy of Antioch, Jerusalem, uh, Constantinople, Rome and Alexandria. Uh, or or what, what actually happened at the Reformation was that we had three philosophers who, for reasons of, 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 of their own private agendas, Luther, Zwingli and Calvin, reconstituted Christianity. Well, they were brilliant and amazing men. I mean, they're, they're absolutely fantastic. But, but, they, but they put Christianity through a sieve of their own pre presuppositions and, and, and preconceptions. Luther had a really serious psychological crisis, and out of that crisis, he built a distorted new Christianity with this a completely artificial uh, fight about faith and works. Anybody who reads the Gospels know that faith and works are utterly interlaced and can never be separated. But, but out, of, out of his distorted existential crisis, Luther dispensed with works, cut out the book of James, effectively. Um, the reformers cut out about five books from the Bible because they didn't fit in with their theology. Who gave them the authority to do that? Um, what did they think they were doing? Uh, and so the, the problem with, with the Protestant mindset is it begins with a whole series of, of, of misconceptions that are out of step with what the Holy Spirit did. And I think to understand Christianity, you have to do what the, the Pentarchy, the five patriarchal centers of East and Western Christianity did. They did it in lockstep until 1054, when they had a completely unnecessary fuss about the filioque, because it wasn't really about that. And, and, then, and then, you know, the, the devil's work has been to slice the church into bits ever since. And the next appalling slice was the Reformation when he sliced it into a thousand different pieces. And, and you have this, this ludicrous position of Protestantism that says everyone can decide what the Bible means. And here we have a thousand denominations all thinking different things to prove it. Well, you know, that, that's, not a, that's not a good place to start. So ecumenism cannot begin by, by validating the presuppositions of Protestantism because they're a really serious category error. Ecumenism has to begin by going back to the first century and tracing through the developments that the Holy Spirit led the church into. 
and 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 then bringing i think the christian mind out of it so you for you most of the potential for any any leaders that you you know of within the protestant wing of faith of of doing that of going back to the beginning and and trying to i think the i think the most exciting thing for me is pentecostalism and the charismatic movement because there is a vividness of the presence of the holy spirit that cuts right through our cerebralism so many of the issues i've been talking about have got to do with a a, a cast of mind and certain theological presuppositions that divide us between each other often many of them built on mis really serious misapprehensions um, you know i mean zwingli's great crisis about in, in cal um sorry calvin's great crisis in in calvinism about um uh, predestination is is a terrible rabbit hole to go down and has, has caused the most enormous trouble but the great thing about charismatic movement pentecostalism is there's an immediacy of the spirit which means that you see christ in somebody else and you and you say at that moment let's start again existentially in the spirit in love in humility in joy let's start again because we're in the holy spirit now at that point i'd like to say well fine how wonderful in that moment of love and trust let's redo church history um and let and let's sidestep the enlightenment and the reformation if we can because that brought in a filtration of the christian experience that is culturally determinative with in terms of the, the the enlightenment and so i mean if for example if you talk to protestants and you say uh they say well you know we don't like catholicism because it's a whore of babylon and it's done these dreadful things and you say to them so how about his orthodoxy and they go what but well, what are your problems with orthodoxy they say i don't know what you're talking about i know nothing about orthodoxy and then you say, well, if, if you knew that the whole of the eastern part of the church believes exactly the same as the western part of the church you're calling the Whore of Babylon, would that affect the way you, you see the, the, the limitations of Catholicism? Well, they don't answer because they've never thought about it, but it ought to. In other words, of, of these three expressions of Christianity, which is the odd, man, odd one out? And the answer is Protestantism is. So I've reached a very unpopular point of view. <laughs> That, that, that probably only the charismatic movement or Pentecostalism can so infuse someone with grace, with sufficient grace and love to set aside their historical presuppositions. But having done that, we all have to learn church history in a linear form from the beginning and watch the acorn unfold into the, into the oak tree. And at that point, when I say Mary, instead of seeing Canaanite queen of heaven fertility cakes, you, you see the, the fifth council of the church and Theotokos. And you hear the Christian community saying, no wonder we have to pray the Hail Mary, because this, this woman is the second Eve. She's the Ark of the Covenant. She's immensely important. And then you discover that Mary keeps on appearing to people. In the, in the fourth century, she appeared to Gregory the Wonderworker with St. John the Apostle. And you discover that the saints, Mary and the saints, constantly burst into time and space. But the Protestant church knows nothing of this. So of course it's offended by, by the, the, the whole theology of the communion of saints, which the Catholic church and the Orthodox church have lived in and lived by for 2000 years. How can you do ecumenism when, you, when, when, when one third of the community is basing its presuppositions on, on a complete misreading and mispresentation of what the Holy Spirit has done to bring the acorn to the oak? Um. Could I ask a question about Catholicism? That's always kind of yes. puzzled me. <laughs> yes, of course. Or orthodoxy. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I became a Christian in 1980, and uh, I was already 30 at the time. So, um, and I knew nothing of Christianity before that. So, I mean, it was all new to me. But at the same time, I, I had known some Catholics in my past and I and I also knew some Catholics when I was a, a new believer I, I got involved with I knew people from the charismatic movement in the Protestant side of things and I knew people from the charismatic movement in the Catholic side of things so I had you know people from all stripes and and we were all trying to follow the Lord but one of the one of my Catholic friends talked a lot about the inerrancy of the Pope and how the Pope was always right. And uh, oh. 
And yet when I look back at the history of what went on in the Catholic Church during the medieval times, there were a lot of times that popes were doing things that you certainly wouldn't want to say that that was all right. And so what, what do you do with that? Okay, it's another mis dreadful mispresentation of, of the truth. Um, and, and so um, there have only been two occasions when the infallibility of the chair. Oh, I need the wrong happened. word, infallibility. Yeah, there doesn't, you go. It doesn't matter. Um, the, the notion of infallibility was developed in 1860 for the first time. And, oh, really? Um, <laughs> and, 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 and all it's intended to do is to say that if Peter's successor and the bishops of the church sit down together and give their mind in, in prayer and unity to a theological issue, they can trust the Holy Spirit to guide them. That's all it means. And only on two occasions ever have they said, we're, we're, we are claiming this. So you're absolutely right. It's not part of the, it's only happened twice in 2000 years. <laughs> it's not, a, it's, so it's not a big thing. And, and, and anyway, so when there were, in other words, when there were these popes in the past that got involved in some. It's nothing to do with individual, it's nothing to do with individual popes. Okay. It's to do, it's to do with the office of the papacy in conjunction with all the bishops. It's a council of the church thing. Right. And the council and the church. I mean, that totally makes sense. That, I mean, it, it just, to me, it's obvious because like in the first oh, church course. that I, in the first church that I was in, it was a, it was a friend's church, a, um, Quaker, came out of the Quaker tradition, but not, not the progressive Quakers, the other kind of Quakers. <laughs> and they had a, a kind of a congregational format where everything was decided by the congregation. So the congregation would come together in meetings and everything had to be unanimous. The spirit had to work unanimously in the body right. for decisions that's the, made. That's the same. That's the same principle. Yeah. It's exactly the same. That, that the leaning on the Holy Spirit and the trusting of the Holy Spirit in certain and very distinctive particular circumstances. And the Catholic Church so limited these circumstances that it hardly ever happens. And, and, and absolutely, um, one of the first books I got before I became a Catholic was a history of the bad popes to remind myself mm -hmm. of, of the grace of God. So again, the problem is that... Um, one of the tricks that the devil does is he, he makes us mishear things and we distort things. So we pick up kind of gossip or lies about each other, which we then overreact to. And that's the history of ecumenism in the church. Well, so I mean, these when, were also you... misunderstandings that Catholic people had about their own tradition. They were the ones who were telling uh, for you sure. about the fallibility of the Pope. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I hear, I hear you yeah. say it was a very ill-educated Catholic who, who <laughs> made the mistake of saying that. Absolutely, quite right. Well, it I mean, take it, I found the whole the thing very interesting because I was when I was a new believer. I lived out in the country, and um, the pastor's wife of our little country church did Bible studies at the church, and quite a few Catholic women from the area would come to the Bible study because in their church they were not. They said, "I don't know if this is true." They said they weren't permitted to read the Bible by themselves, that they were only permitted to hear the Bible as taught by the priest on Sunday morning. Now and here's so they the, would come to these Protestant Bible studies so that they could read the Bible themselves. And this is where Protestantism is more true than Catholicism. Catholicism has failed to develop um, hymns, praying, Bible reading, and Christian community. It's failed lamentably. And Protestantism has succeeded amazingly. So if it sounded like I was a narrow-minded um, bigot about Protestantism earlier on, let me now say that Protestantism has all these gifts which Catholicism yearns for and needs. And, and the, part of the tragedy is that, that both parts of the church need each other. And for, for as long as they're set against each other, as long as it's Protestants who do Bible study and prayer meetings, Catholic clergy are going to be suspicious of them and say, well, this isn't for us. But there's, so, there's often so little pastoral care in Catholicism, so little sense of Christian community, so few prayer meetings for the laity, dreadful over-clericalization. One has to distinguish between bad Christian culture 
and, and, and the, the template the Holy Spirit lays down to give us good things. And the same thing is true of our Protestantism. We can say, look at these terrible Protestant bad practices. You and I will have 20 bad stories about yes. evangelicals getting themselves into a terrible fix. But we wouldn't want that to ruin our sense of the charism that evangelicalism brings, which is a vivid relationship with Jesus, a real hunger for the word, a sense of the immediacy of the Holy Spirit in the, in the everyday. But these are fantastic, but they shouldn't be corralled off into Protestantism any more than the Mass and the Saints and Our Lady uh, and exorcism should be corralled off into Catholicism. Um, we've, we've got this dreadful situation where we've allowed a fragmented church to weaken us. It's a bit like, you know, people believing in restaurants, but some people only ever go out and have an aperitif and wonder why they're malnourished. And some people only ever go out and they will only stick to the puddings and they wonder where they're fat. <laughs> and some people only ever have a main course and they wonder if there's more to life than that. <laughs> and the answer is, you, if you go to restaurants, you should be able to have an aperitif, a main course and a pudding. And, you know, that's the full menu. And the problem with the church is we don't feed off the full menu because the church has been divided off so that bits well, are I mean, off limits. Isn't, isn't that just the human problem? I mean, years ago, after I became a believer, I, all, my husband and, at that time, and I also felt like we were called to mission work. And so we went off and got graduate degrees so that we could go teach English in Asia. And in preparation, we went to a missionary training program. And while we were there, we met missionaries who were going out to all the world and we all lived together for like six weeks it was such a fantastic experience one of the guys was a missionary who was going to be going to england and he he had this theory and i just thought it was such a brilliant theory that it totally made sense to me he said he believes that this is where the denominations came from the lord comes to a believer gives him a gift shows him some truth you know probably the holy spirit comes to somebody shows them some truth and this truth is for the whole body but this person starts their own little gig they get their church going and then that gig is for those people in that church and they think they've got the whole truth and so the lord says well i'm gonna have to go tell somebody else the other part of it so he goes and starts with somebody else here, this is another part of it. You, you don't get it. And then that guy holds it to himself because that's the human condition. Absolutely right. And we're, we've got the truth and we're the only ones. You know, we're going to hold only, it to ourselves. You're right. That's exactly right. I agree with that completely. And so the only antidote to that is to become Catholic and to rejoin the church that Jesus founded. And I'm serious. If everyone became Catholic and rejoined the church that Jesus founded, all these gigs would be within the one church and the one church would also be able to bring discernment to it so the astonishing history of the catholic church is that it's fallen into into to sin and disorder and decay and the holy spirit in every hundred years renews it and revives it we could look at every single century and find a saint who brought revival and holiness to the church he's never stopped doing it and it's really naughty that protestants uh, look at the catholic church and see it as the abandoned or of Babylon or the abandoned church that fell into to work. So it's, it's a complete misreading of history. And in fact, most of the miraculous, it seems to me, still takes place in the Catholic Church. One of the reasons I became a Catholic was when I discovered the Eucharistic miracle of Buenos Aires in 1994. And I thought, how is it I've got to the age of 60 and I've never found this before? So as a Protestant, I didn't know whether to believe Zwingli or Luther about what happened to the bread and the wine. And I thought the problem was all about Thomas Aquinas borrowing Aristotelian theology with this stupid notion of transubstantiation. And if he hadn't got so Aristotelian and so up himself, you know, then we could we could more easily deal with the very sensible conversation that Zwingli and Luther had about about, you know, whereabouts in this whole spectrum the, the work of the Holy Spirit was. I had no idea. That for the whole of the of, of the last 2000 years, Eucharistic miracles have been taking place and that it wasn't Thomas Aquinas at all. But that, in, that the, for example, in 1994, a host began to bleed in a parish in Buenos Aires, the bishop who happened to be Jorge Bergoglio, whom we now know as Pope Francis. And they took this thing and they put it in some water and put it in a jar and left it there. And three years later, they sent it off to a laboratory and because because it continued to, to, to bleed, it seems. 
and they said that they asked the laboratory to do a blind test and then take and they said what is this thing and the laboratory said these are white myocardial blood cells these are cells from the left ventricle of the heart how did you get human tissue from a recently deceased heart and when they said that this is a new york pathologist and when they said it comes from a bleeding you can burn the buenos aires the, the atheist jewish scientist who was the world authority this became a catholic christian because he said it, it's impossible it's impossible you should even have been able to give me tissue with white blood cells in it at this stage and so it turns out that that, that all thomas aquinas was doing was 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 finding some kind of philosophical categorization to give expression to what had always happened to the church so from the, the year 100 they called the eucharist the food of immortality the, the, it was miraculous from the beginning and and it was only in 1520 with the enlightenment mindset that they stopped and said wait a moment we can't believe all this and they, they didn't know about the eucharistic miracles they were a bunch of european intellectuals living in their own time warp who, who had a broken relationship with the history of the church and were deeply caught up with European power politics. So then when I discovered that this has happened half a dozen times since 1994, bleeding hosts have been taken for, for forensic examination and only to discover white human white blood cells, he said, we really are eating Jesus. And that's partly what I mean by saying, the, you know, belief in the supernatural is an absolute prerequisite for being a Christian. And that, that only if you look at the way the church has understood the Eucharist for 2000 years, can you get there? You can't get there by starting again with a bunch of empiric empirical politicians in the middle of Europe in 1520 with their prejudices. You know, I mean, I thought people always say, oh, well, you know, Calvin has read the church fathers. Look, see how he quotes a dozen of them. But it was only recently when I discovered that Calvin only quoted the ones he liked and got rid of the ones he didn't like. There was no sense of accountability in Calvin or Zwingli or Luther to the apostolic church of the first three centuries. They, they, they picked and chose between the councils they liked and the teachings they liked and the ones that didn't suit them. And they had three different not suiting. Already there were three different Protestant mindsets. It, it, the, the road to ecumenism is to start history with the New Testament and to work, work one's way through in a linear way to see what the Holy Spirit has led the church into. And, and, and the Pope is indeed the rock upon which the church is founded. Uh, it's not the faith of the individual believer. Of, co of course, the faith of the individual believer is part of, of the church. But all that gives you is a theology of the believer. It doesn't give you an ecclesiology. But Jesus was forming an ecclesiology. I'm going to found the church on this, not, not, not the integrity of individual believers who might, might belong to some hidden organism we can't judge. And the extraordinary thing is that, 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 that Every time we leave the Catholic Church, we break the Catholic Church, or there's a schism of some kind, we increase this, exactly what your gifted friend described, the, the isolationism of private charisms that get kept away from the church. Of course, the Catholic Church doesn't do Bible study because it's a Protestant thing. Of course, it doesn't do fellowship because the Protestants are keeping it to themselves. Of course, they're not doing proper hymns and, and, and worship and music because it's a Protestant thing. The way to ecumenism for all the Protestants to apologize for misreading the Catholic Church, become Catholics and bring all the gifts the Holy Spirit has given them back into the church. And then under the apostleship of Peter, we will, we will have what it takes to convert the world. Well, it sounds to me, though, that, <laughs> that that's a little bit one sided maybe the people that are saying we can't have bible studies and we can't have fellowship and we can't have great hymns because the protestants are doing it ought to change a little bit and say wait a minute what is the holy spirit telling us about bible study what is the holy spirit telling us about community because i mean community is like one of the most salient features of what it means to be in the bodies, to be in community. And I don't see how you can do church without community and, and without Bible study. So maybe, maybe if there really were going to be a unity, then both sides have to give a little bit, right? One side has to start saying, let's have this fragrance in the church and make it a place that people want to come. So the, the problem is, I, I, you're not wrong, but I still think you've got, you, you're, you're working from a Protestant mindset when you say both sides. <laughs> well, that's who I am. Of course, of course you are. But look, it's like saying that, that you have parents 
uh, with a large family and five children have stayed at home and five children have run away. Now, the five children have run away are saying, hey, break up the family home, come and, come and run away with us. This runaway thing is great. And, and the parents are saying, no, no, we need a home. You need to come back home and bring what you've brought and be at home. It's not two sides, it's home and runaway. <laughs> Protestants are runaways, <laughs> they need to come home. Um, and, and one of the things that's happening in the Catholic Church at the moment is a lot of Protestants are becoming Catholics. And as they, and you say how, you know, there should be a give, you're quite right. But the give only happens when the church is shocked by the infusion of these spirit-filled Protestants who bring their gifts back into the church that Jesus founded and so infuse and renew it. But that's the only way it's gonna happen. It's not gonna happen by committees of, of elderly, boring old men having negotiated standoffs with philosophical and theological presuppositions <laughs> that only someone with five PhDs can understand. What's that going to do to the body of Christ? It's a nonsense. That's the fake ecumenism. Nor is it going to be the kind of ecumenism like a card game. Well, I'll give you one of my cards if you give me one of your cards. That, that's not ecumenism either. No, it's going to be coming, it's going to be coming back. The, 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 the Orthodox have got to apologize uh, to, to, to the Patriarch of Rome, the Patriarchs of Constantinople and Alexandria and Antioch have got to apologize and say, we're really sorry, Peter had supremacy. By the way, you used it really badly and you owe us an apology too. <laughs> and, and, and the Protestants need to stop being runaways and come back home and bring their gifts. So we have one church that Jesus founded in which we begin to, to, to put the charisms together. Every time someone does a runaway thing and says, here's my gift from Jesus, their, their ministry is amplified and, and the church is wounded and diminished. Mm -hmm. And when they die, what happens? It doesn't get passed on. Usually it's a one generational thing and the church is diminished and denuded. It's not the way to do things. Now, I know, I know it, I'm exaggerating and I'm being a bit dem demagogic, and, but I'm, I'm trying to do it really to make a point. I'd like to have said to myself 30 years ago, hey, you're really making a mistake. There's only one solution to this. You're going to have to become a Catholic. I'd have been furious. I'd have said, don't you pompous person. <laughs> don't you tell me that from your authoritarian, monarchical, clerical, child abuse, riddled, corrupt organization. I'm not having that. But I think it's true. Well, I think that kind of naturally leads into the last topic that we were going to cover, which is the collective versus the community. Right. And um, we probably have maybe 10 minutes before before we get to wind this I'm sure up. We've, I'm sure we've lost lots of people already, but if you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> if they're still here and they want to hear about collective versus community. The reason I thought this would be an interesting topic is that uh, it seems like there's a big confusion well, there are a lot of big confusions in our world today, but one of them is that um, well, I mean, there are different ways that you can read the book of Acts when it says that they held everything in common. Some people take that to mean, you know, it was like a communist collective putting everything together um, versus let me interrupt you. Can I interrupt you straight away and say mm -hmm. there's a, there are two different ways and, the, and, and they're the Protestant and the Catholic way of reading the Book of Acts. And if you read it as the Protestant way, then this becomes a universal template for all Christian communities. Let's behave like the disciples on the day of Pentecost. But if you read it in the Catholic way, you say this was the playpen. This was the infancy. This was preschool. This, this, these were a whole lot of people who had just become Christians and in developmental stages, they, 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 they were learning everything. There's so much they didn't know. But one of the phenomena that marked their, their, the learning process was this detachment from possessions. So we, we don't take holding all things in common as a template for church communities forever. But we say when the Holy Spirit comes, he's, he's going to make your possessions much less important. And that's going to continue all the way through the church. And then what you discover is you look at the monasteries. One of the greatest examples of that particular aspect of Acts were the monastic communities. It just so happens that the monastic communities who held all things in common, like the Acts book does, the Acts, if you read it in the Catholic way, they were the engines of evangelism and renewal in Europe. So if you hold all things in common and you understand, and then you, and then you take that to St. Benedict, 
and you see what the Holy Spirit does with St. Benedict and his communities, and then you look at St. Dominic and then the Cistercians, and you see how the Holy Spirit takes this great principle of communities, of prayer, and then you see the whole of Western Christendom was created from this principle of having all things in common held in communities of prayer. Wow! But what you don't do is take it as a Protestant paradigm and say, okay, well, that's the mark of every Christian community because it happened in Acts, it's gonna happen today, just like that. But do you think that that, that fundamental, I guess you'd call that a category error, um, which probably got increased by the enlightenment is part of the reason why um, we have so many of this, so much of this fraction, fractionization in our culture today of different collectives. You have, you know, you have the, the gender collectives and you have the racial collectives and you have the uh, political collectives. You have all these different groups that group up around, um, <clears throat> It's not the same thing as a community because in my mind, community is always made up of people who, are, who vary in age and in interest and um, <clears throat> every aspect of the people in a community, <clears throat> there's this vari variability, but in collective, everybody is all the same. They have their little this so and that I, group. I don't think it's about community collective. I, I think that uh, you have this, you have a utopianism, we're back to telos and teleology. We're all called to, to salvation and the kingdom of heaven. We know there's a goal we're being called to. And despite the fact that our body breaks down, we still think we're heading somewhere. <laughs> and the problem for the atheist and materialist is it appears to be death. So where's progress then? But if we're heading somewhere, you then have three heresies or three deviations, which are really cause problems. And they're, they're impatience, pride, and a lust for power. And if you're impatient, it means it means you're not willing to wait for the kingdom of heaven. You want the utopia now. And if you're proud, you're not willing to let God do it. You want to do it yourself. And if you believe in power rather than love, you're going to make it happen. And so these are the three elements of critical race theory and, 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 of, and of Marxism. Uh, all, all the utopianisms derive their, their, their heretical deviances from the Christian hope and Christian sense of teleology where we're getting to but with, with, with these three deviations I want it now I'm not going to believe in God to do it I'm going to do it myself uh, and I'm going to make it happen because of my hubris power rather than love and these these three deviations distort this natural teleology that God has given us which is a hunger for heaven and turn it into a political project which then becomes a nightmare it becomes hell and you only have to look at, at, at how you know, the, the whole Soviet Union thing, um, the, the, the dreadful thing in the Soviet Union, the dreadful thing in China, the dreadful thing in Cuba, the dreadful thing in Venezuela, where these three deviations for our utopian longing, which, which is supposed to carry us to heaven, instead create hell on earth. So it doesn't matter that it's critical race theory now instead of the rise of the proletariat. It's the same deviation. It's just a different variation upon this hellish theme. And Christians should should... If, if we had developed the Christian mind, we would be able to say to the utopians, the Black Lives Matter people, this longing for justice and equality and diversity inclusion you've got, it has a really wonderful route, but it's been hijacked. You've, you're off the rails. You're going in a, in a different direction. Let me introduce you to Jesus because this is what's going to happen. Uh, and, and all your, you know, if, if, if the state, if, if your program follows, then the state is going to forcibly redistribute goods, whether it's power or, or material goods. Mm -hmm. And when it does that, there will be no more inclusion because you're going to have to exclude certain people when you take the power away from them. And there'll be no more tolerance because you're going to have to impose it by power. So although you pretend that this egalitarian movement is based on inclusion, diversity and tolerance, there won't be any inclusion or diversity or tolerance. Um, because you will in fact build hell on earth. Let's take you back to the Soviet gulags. Let's take you to uh, Mao Zedong. Let's take you to Stalin. Let's take you to Cuba, for goodness sake. But Christians have so lost the confidence in the Christian mind, they're unable to see a, a heresy of their own beliefs when they see it. And they look at Black Lives Matter and say, oh, that's cool. Wouldn't that be nice if people weren't racist anymore? <laughs> As if racism was some kind of deviation of human goodness rather than 
just one more part of the fall of human nature. Well, that's what I was going to say. What you described there sounded exactly like the fall. I mean, the impatience, the pride, and the lust for power, wanting the knowledge of of good and evil right now, you know. (laughs) I don't want to wait for it in in God's timing. I want it right now, and I'm going to get it with ill-gotten gains. Wouldn't it be amazing if all the bishops and the evangelists in the Christian world spoke to critical race theory, spoke to Marxism, spoke to socialism and said, you've got it wrong. Come to Jesus. This is the kingdom of heaven. But instead, they're so weak in their Christian mind, weak in their faith, unsure of their own theological foundations, that they go, cool, this would be great if we could bring it about. Let's go with these people. They seem to know what they're talking about. What, what anemics we must have become spiritually to be so taken in by people just because uh, they, they've, reta- they've quite properly retained their enthusiasm and don't understand how it's been hijacked to create hell instead of heaven. Well, it, it's a lack of just fundamental education somehow, because even as poor an education as I had in the 60s, one of the things that we did learn is that utopias always end badly and they always right. require coercion and right. that's it, you know, so. Um, but but unfortunately, uh, the, the, the utopians have taken charge of education in the last 50 years. So guess yeah. what? They don't teach that anymore. Yes. Yep. Well, this has been very stimulating, Gavin, I got to say. <laughs> Can I say for everyone who's come along with me without throwing a book at their screen or at my head, thank you very much for your patience and, and, and for your kindness. And uh, uh, it's been great to have the conversation. And, and if, I've, if I've expressed things too bluntly or, or too enthusiastically, please, please forgive me. It's, it's in order to stimulate a conversation and uh, well, for allow people to take the things I'm trying to grasp and express them better than I can. The, the lovely thing is your enthusiasm. I mean, you, it's obviously that you love the Lord and you love the place that you're at right now and you have a great excitement and enthusiasm and um, enthusiasm, doesn't that, I mean, John Verveke said the other day, it comes from en theos. En theos, so. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, if God is in you, you should have a certain amount of en theos, enthusiasm. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, I'm, 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 so, I'm caught up by, I guess I feel that, that I feel like a, a 400 yard um, a, a runner who's has to do four laps and I'm, I'm 66 now and I've done three of my laps if I you know I'm on the last lap I've made so many mistakes um, but I'm on the last lap and I need to go harder and faster and, and, and in a more determined way uh, and I happen also to believe um, that he who endures to the end shall be saved and that, that therefore a lot is asked of me on this last lap. I'm no less, I'm no less amazed by the mystery and the beauty and the, and the wondrousness of, of God in Christ, of the Father who comes to us by the Spirit. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm no less amazed at my own incapacity to, and, and to my, 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 my gift of screwing it up. Um, and I think I've realized I didn't realize that our, our, our culture was going to crash towards the end of my life. And that like Augustine, the vandals will be at the gates as I began to fade. But I think we are at the end of a culture and the end of a civilization. We're certainly at the end of some kind of times. Uh, and God has given us the responsibility for keeping witness in this time of very serious pressure and misrepresentation of the faith. So he's given us a great responsibility. And, um, and one thing we're not going to do is be cowed and bullied and frightened and, and outgunned by people who don't know what they're doing and who need to be turned around. Well, I like the fact that you use the word witness. You see my book back here. I do see it. <laughs> have, you, have you ever read that book? No, but I clearly must. <laughs> oh, it's a... It, it, he has a page in there describing coming to Christ he came to Christ as an ex-communist and as an adult, but the page where he describes that is probably the most painfully beautiful thing I've ever read. But it's also the story of um, 
Well, it's sort of the beginning of the disintegration of our culture here in this country, anyway. I don't know when the, I don't know when it began to disintegrate over there where you are. Oh, but... We're ahead of you in Europe, I'm afraid. Yeah, but this disintegration. Was, this was written in the '50s, and um, it's a spectacular book. So I must read it. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been lovely, Gavin, and I, I hope you get a chance to talk again someday. Oh, I look forward to it very much indeed. And maybe, mommy, maybe give people. Can, can throw up some questions and some comments and, and we can, um, you know, we can deal with, again, deal with misunderstanding and try and, and, and thrash out things in a, in a clearer, more, more coherent way. But anyway, it's been a great well, It probably would be help instead, I think we started, it sounded almost adversarial in the beginning, which it certainly wasn't from my standpoint, where I threw up a bunch of polarities and you came at it with the Christian mind, which was perfectly the right thing to do. I would really like to explore more exactly what you mean by the Christian mind and how that builds oh, up. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, so no, I if, think it's very important. If you could start that just as a, um, a foundational issue, building, 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 it would probably make more sense than having to come at it from this side and that side to tackle various ideas. Um, yeah. So Brilliant. one of my lights has gone out. So it's clearly okay. <laughs> <laughs> whether that's a sign of the culture, light of the culture is going out or time to stop. I'd love to do that. It'd be great to have a conversation about developing the Christian mind. I, I'd learn a lot from it and from you. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, Gavin. Bye-bye. God bless. Bye. Bye for now. God bless.